Hello, welcome to our next topic. Anybody want to guess what we're going to be talking about? And if you're guessing proteins, you are right. Proteins uh, get all their importance because they were one of the first mac. They were the first macronutrient isolated, and they gave them the name protein for the word, the Greek word meaning primary. Uh, and we still have this conception that it is the most important of them all. If you sucked all the water out of your body, you would be 50% protein. So yeah, they are pretty darn important. And whether you knew it or not, this topic actually, today we're gonna to be talking about is amino acids which is what proteins are made up of. Now, that's really the only thing you need to know from this first slide is that proteins are a polymer of amino acids. There are trillions of different types in all species, trillions. Um, and each one has unique shape and function, as this gentleman is showing. Your hair is a protein, why we can shape it into such wonderful shapes and your feathers if you want to show them right now is mating season for all the birds so the colors the feathers are out there your horns so usually i show off my horns you can't see them with my curls when we're in office hours your nails those nice big nails those are a protein those are your blood vessel your blood your hemoglobin that is transporting your oxygen in your blood, as well as your immune system in your blood. So your immunoglobulins, whenever you hear something that says the word globulin or something, that will be a protein. And of course your muscles. Uh, and your skin, your skin is collagen. And so here I am in my 50s, this is a self-portrait. Oh, I don't think I look quite like that. And that's because I eat lots of fruit, and we'll get to that. And of course, there are some hormones that are proteins, uh, such as insulin. And of course, when we talked about lipids, we saw another group of hormones, and we'll begin to hormones um, in next week. So proteins are made up of amino acid, and this is what they look like. And we're going to see a video clip in one or two slides where we're gonna practice drawing these. But the trick is they always have an amino group, which is this over here, the nitrogen. So nitrogen means amine. So they call it an amino group and a carboxy group, which, oh, it looks just like the fatty acid. These guys are extremely hydrophilic because they have both sides and there's just this one carbon in between. Now, the reason I like this picture, and you're gonna hear me say this in the video clip, it correctly shows an amino acid. Most books show it incorrectly, and um, that is, it's showing it ionized. In our body, amino acids are always ionized. So the nitrogen has this extra bond, which gives it a positive, and this oxygen lost its hydrogen, so it has a negative. And so they're always in this ionic form. This group down here is variable, and we'll see that on the next slide. So this carbon in the middle has four different things around it. So what is the word, Joey? Oh, it's chiral, but that was a good guess, Joey. So they form peptide bonds. It's like they're holding hands and they make this huge polymer. And remember those good old days when we could all hold hands? and we will be there again. And here we go, these are the 20 that are our building blocks. There are many other amino acids, and I go off on a small tangent in the video. You do not, of course, have to memorize this because everything's open book for this term. Uh, this chart is actually at the end of study set five. So you might wanna pause me and uh, go and print up study set five, or you will need this chart um, at the end of study set five. All right, um, the other thing I want to mention is, sorry, uh, amino acids, as I said, actually I already mentioned, they're always in, there's what's called a zwitter ion form, which means they're always ionized. So most books show them like this, which are actually never found like that. Um, and so I like this picture also because I didn't want you to be 
disoriented. You're going to see me draw it like I had on the previous slide. Um, so I put the carbon, the hydrogen above, the carboxy on the right, and the amino on the left. And this group down here in green, I didn't point that out, is the part that varies. Um, and you can see this group actually gives it distinct properties. And so your chart's nicely color-coded. So if you only have carbons down here, that would make it nonpolar. If you suddenly have OHs or NHs, that's gonna make it polar. Um, so all amino acids are very hydrophilic, but it's this extra group down here that makes it special. All right, so the Zwitter ions are always ionized. These corners are just carbons. Um, and then our groups here. And so this is kind of cool. They turned it sideways and rotated it. And this one down here, they also did that. So you will sometimes see amino acids drawn where they show the nitrogen above or below. And so it's the fact that they show it with this carboxy. Anything that has the carboxyl group and the amino group is considered an amino acid. The ones that are the building blocks in our body will have this one carbon in between. Uh, this slide shows something that is just a minor piece. We are always going to show them like this middle picture ionized. But in our body, there is a place, which is our stomach, where the pH is very low. It's a pH of 2. And a pH of 2 means there's lots of extra hydrogen ions around. And so when your proteins, amino acids, get to your stomach, uh, this is actually important. This hydrogens get filled in and you no longer have that negative. If you went to a place where the pH was very high, which actually does happen in a place in your small intestines, this actually would happen that you would lose the hydrogen and also off the, this one. We're gonna be drawing them like in this picture. You might see one question in your homework that says, hey, what would happen if we change the pH? Um, something else I wanted to show you since I was mentioning pH is there are some down here, I'm going to talk about this in the video clip, that are acidic and basic. So again, all amino acids are acids and bases, but it's the side group that makes them special. And so this side group here on these two, which many books call aspartic acid and glutamic acid incorrectly, um, they actually have this extra carboxyl group and it is also ionized. And so it is correctly named here as aspartate and glutamate. And I talk about this in a video clip. Uh, these are basic because they have an extra nitrogen group and that nitrogen group has that extra positive. So when the pH changes, those groups would also change, which does become important for the lab we will be doing, that you'll be doing in your kitchen in week five. All right, so. Here you go. Hello. We're going to talk about amino acids and how to draw carbon, core bond. Above, you're going to put hydrogen. And over here on the left, we're going to do an amino group, which is nitrogen. Uh, and nitrogen. So I'm going to show you the wrong way first, is often shown as nitrogen with two hydrogens. So nitrogen makes three bonds. Uh, it has a lone pair of electrons that we don't show. So nitrogen makes three bonds because it's in the 5A group on the periodic table, so it needs three bonds to get to its octet. Uh, in our body, this is ionized. And so most books show it as that, as an NH2. It is correctly and NH3, it picks up an extra hydrogen uh, and it has a positive charge. All right, on the other side, you're gonna have your acid, which is always a carbon with two oxygens on it, and this is the correct way to show it. So the one oxygen is a double bonded oxygen, and the other oxygen is an OH, which is the acid group. And the acid uh, donates a hydrogen, and in our body, this is already donated its hydrogen. And so this hydrogen is gone, and it's a negative. Uh, and the nitrogen picks up hydrogen. So they're not picking them up necessarily from each other. It's more that um, there's just these, these act as a buffer in our body. They're one of our buffering systems because they can donate and pick up hydrogens as needed to keep our body pH in a healthy range. 
Um, but they are, these are called glitter ions. And in our body, all amino acids are glitter ions, which means you have the positive and negative. So they're both a cation and an anion. Overall, there's no charge, so if you put it into a field that had um, a positive and a negative, so an electrical field, uh, you would not see movement of it. All right, so this down here is called the R group, and this varies. Uh, it can be different things, and we're going to do examples with them in a moment. So you have probably already showed the picture, or it's the next slide after this little video, but in your study set five, the very last page is a picture of the 20 amino acids um, that you will have for yourself. That um, I, I like this picture because I don't like this picture. It does not show it ionized. Maybe the one I posted for you guys, I think it does show it correctly ionized. Uh, and they do sometimes, different places show these, where it will show the R group on the left or the right, but these four bonds are tetrahedral, and um, so they're all equivalent. So don't let that confuse you. We're just going to draw it like this to keep it simple. This carbon, by the way, is the carbon next to the carboxylic acid is called the alpha carbon. So we talked about that with fatty acids, the omega was the far end. The alpha is the carbon actually next to the carboxylic acid. And so these are all alpha amino acids that we're going to be drawing where the amino is right there. Something that's kind of cool is you may have heard of GABA. Uh, GABA stands for gamma amino. Uh, and then the B is butyric, which is four carbon, so butyric acid. And so if you had four total carbons, you have the acid on the one end. This is called the alpha, the beta, the gamma position. This is where the nitrogen is. And then these hydrogens would have hydrogens, actually. These carbons just have hydrogens. So that's what GABA is. There's actually an amino, I'm sorry, there's an alpha amino butyric acid where the nitrogen's here, a beta amino butyric acid. Um, and I don't know if they all exist in our body. GABA is a neurotransmitter that we'll talk about um, in two weeks or in a week that helps to calm us. It helps to decrease the chatter that's always going on. And once you establish meditation practice, and it doesn't mean you're sitting there doing these weird contortions and muttering, although you can do that. Uh, it's just finding that time to sit. And prayer is absolutely the same thing as meditation, no matter what people want to debate about. But you do get to a point where your brain will release GABA. You just see the, the seat where you're going, and everybody ends up having a place that they decide, this is, this is my quiet place, and you just, taking 10 minutes and just sitting quietly, listening to your heart, um, just listening to your heartbeat, and just trying to hear your heartbeat, stop listening to the clutter in your mind, and it calms down and releases GAB and then gets more release and it helps with calming. Um, a lot of the anti-anxiety are trying to mimic GABA. All right, so these R groups is what we're going to talk about. And the R groups can be different. So there's four possibilities. Uh, they can be nonpolar. So NP is my abbreviation. Uh, NP, nonpolar would mean carbon and hydrogen only. So if we see examples where it's only carbon and hydrogen, it's nonpolar. Uh, second choice is polar. And I have Mama Polar Bear here off screen. She keeps falling off the thing, but she's here because of this. And so you're going to see oxygen uh, or nitrogen. So there's a pool. These guys are greedy. They pull. Uh, the next two choices are acidic or basic. Now, this is the R group that we're talking about. All amino acids are both acids and bases. So basic part was the amino, the acid part was the acid. Um, this is so that there is an extra for an acid C double bond O O group. Uh, it is ionized also in your body. And the basic group would have an extra NH3 positive group. There's two different types of nitrogen groups in our body. So an extra amino group 
uh, would make it basic. You guys are always going to have the chart, and so you would be able to look at that um, unless there is this beautiful miracle that happens, uh, and we do get to come back on campus, in which case uh, everybody actually gets this. They, they're able to draw them. Everybody gets the drawings beautiful. Uh, and what we would do is we're going to go ahead and draw these, and then we're going to put together, oh, I want to add one more piece with this. Uh, these R groups have interactions. And these interactions, there's four of them, and it's going to become important when we look at levels of structure. If I want to go through them now, because I have this nice little chart here, and I don't know if I'll have another nice little chart on the board for you. Uh, when carbon, when you're nonpolar, the term that most of you are probably familiar with is hydrophobic. So they're not, they're, they don't like water. These amino acids when we make it into proteins, these are we're going to find are on the inside of the protein because on the outside is where the water is and they don't like that. So they hide on the inside. So we just say they're hydrophobic. The polar ones, because they have an O or an N, they're going to do a bond. And then the acidic and basic ones are going to do something called a salt bridge. Uh, salt or ionic bridge. The term I always learned was a salt bridge, but I have seen it called an ionic bridge, and that is because you have a positive and negative. This, these attractions are all, these are all just attractions of a positive negative, or in the case of hydrophobic, it's just not wanting to be around positive negative or anything that would have that, uh, and so it is not a bond. That is key to realize. These lines that we're drawing, these are bonds. So it's like your shoulder is attached to your arm. You can't just pull it off. But me, the polar bear, well, this is this is like an attraction. Oh, oh no, the baby's gone. He's swimming off. They do that. All right, so come back. It's an attraction. Velcro is a really good example. No, I can't follow Okay, he's back. Okay, he's safe. He's just starting to learn to happen to all, all creatures everywhere. All right, we're going to do examples over here. So you move us to the other board. We have it set up for you. And you can pause and write down the examples. I'm going to keep going. Um, these would be our amino acids. And you guys are going to have that chart, but I'm going to ask you to try to challenge yourself because they've never had the chart except for doing their homework. And they all learned how to do it, and it gives you a stronger understanding if you're able to draw it. So, drawing a carbon, and then you can look on the chart and see if you got it. And it also helps you when you see it in different arrangements. They're always going to have a carbon and four things around them. Hydrogen on top, carboxyl group on that side, ionized correctly, the nitrogen group down below, and then the R, I'm sorry, on the left, and then the R group. So you will have, again, the notes, but for those who had Chem 105, it's kind of a fun thing to see if you remember anything. The R group is a methyl. Methyl means one carbon. And carbons make four bonds, so methyl is a CH3 that would be attached there. And then I would ask you questions. Hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Uh, so oh, I froze. So the basic. So this one is nonpolar in our category. Okay, so the next one. Draw your carbon, put your four bonds, put your H above. One of the beauties is you can stop me at any time to catch up. We're in class, everybody be like, what, what, what you doing? All right, and then this is going to have methanol. So meth means one carbon, and then the OL means there's going to be an OH. So we often will write it like this, you can write it like that, some of you are going, that you do. Uh, so it would be a CH2 and an OH. So the carbon makes four bonds and then there's an OH on it. So if I ask you to categorize it, this OH is going to be pooling. So this is going to be pulling. In fact, I'll ask you then at some point what kind of interactions and you would say, oh, OH, H bond. Um, that would be, John, that's another question you'd ask me. What do you need to remember? Yeah, the intermolecular forces. 
totally forgot polar, not polar, would come back in here. All right, so again, draw your carbon. And you don't need to know what a butyl is. You guys will have your, your little charts to look at. But for those of you who took organic chemistry, it's kind of fun. And actually, when we used to meet, it was a bonus point, if you could remember it. Uh, in about half the class had had 105, and they could. And it was kind of cool to see that you remembered something. So this means you have four carbons. Uh, you can do it as a zigzag. I'm going to show this one as a zigzag, just for fun. So there's one carbon, two, three, four. So these are carbons, one, two, three, four. And then off the last one would be the amine group. And it is ionized. In our body, it is ionized. So these are carbons. You can write them in as CH2s if you want. Uh, what I learned is about half of you like zigzags and half of you don't. That's not me. All right, and then the last one. Oh, this would be basic. And because it has this extra nitrogen group. All right, last one. Hydrogen. And then we're going to do F, which means two carbons. I'll draw them in this time. And then, oh, this is ethanoate. It is ethanoic acid, but it's been ionized. So carbon has a double bond with O and then an O negative because it lost its hydrogen. In our body, they're always ionized. The acidic and basic ones will have this extra positive and negative. This is an acidic one is how it's classified. So on most charts, it is called aspartic acid, but it never exists as aspartic acid in our body. It always exists as aspartate. Um, and so aspartame, uh, Joey did his talk last term on aspartame NutraSweet. Uh, this is one of the amino acids. So phenylalanine is the other one, and then it's hooked up to a methoxy. Uh, but if you're still looking for a topic, which probably almost all of you are, um, that can be a fun topic. Mention other ones. I'm sure I've already mentioned a whole bunch. All right, let's bring you one more. Oh, and so those, if they were in the right place, they could have an attraction to each other because of the positive negative. Um, we're going to do one more thing with these since I'm over here. And we're going to make a peptide bond. So we're going to make a peptide, which is when you hook amino acids together. We're going to make a tetrapeptide. A tetra peptide because we have four amino acids we're going to hook together. Uh, and here we go. So I'm going to change this just for this one because it can help some students, but it really doesn't matter. It more matters that you can put it together. How this happens is remember the squid girl chemistry where we lassoed that? I don't have a squid hat. We can do the princess for the day chemistry. There's our water that comes off. So what happens is they're going to all lose the oxygen and the hydrogens that are in there, and the pluses and minuses, and they hook up. That's the peptide bond. Now, there's one more piece. The nitrogen does have to have three bonds, so you would need to show it still has one of its hydrogens left. So here, again, there's a peptide bond. It is called a peptide bond. Again, something for those of you who took Chem 105. That is an amide. So there you remember that or not. That's the very last thing we covered. And we got one more bond to do. So we erase the positives, the negatives, the oxygen. Um, so the carbonyl is there, and it hooks straight to nitrogen. Nitrogen still has its hydrogen. And there is our peptide bond. So we have three peptide bonds. We made a tetrapeptide. Uh, and so then if you ate this, your stomach is going to jiggle it apart and then digest it and break the bonds or hydrolyze it. So hydrolysis is where it would break it back into the amino acids. And that's where we would be. All right. I will see you next time. Oops. Hello. We're going to talk about amino acids. I always need Joey to get me to the next slide. Oh, all right. So let's talk about, yeah, I made that slideshow. 
I think before classes started and they had not yet canceled for the whole month of May and June and July and August. So that's why I was still fantasizing about we would all be back together this next week. All right. Um, I did mention that I would have some topic ideas and these next three slides are actually um, from students who had some topics. So glutamine is one of the amino acids. Amino acids are building blocks for proteins, but amino acids each have their own um, niche places. They have something they do for our body. So glutamine's a fascinating one. Here is the piece, this carbon right here, my arrow is, and it's not shown correctly, it should be ionized. There would be a hydrogen up, and then this piece is a side group. This is not acidic or basic, because this is a nitrogen and an oxygen, and so it is a polar side group. Um, the thing that's really cool about glutamine, glutamine is absolutely important for muscle repair after exercise. So this was somebody who was a bodybuilder. 60% uh, of our muscle is actually made up of this amino acid. And so after exercise, our muscles actually break down and we, it decreases by 50%. And we get this post-workout fatigue and we just feel like that. Uh, so yeah, it's really interesting. Your muscles actually break down to replenish the supply in the blood. It's really weird, but it's true. Um, another purpose of glutamine is glutamine acts as a nitrogen sponge. Uh, and it is formed from glutamate, which is another amino acid. And so it balances out pH. And why that's important, oh, this is acidic blood. This actually means your blood's at 7.2. And this is healthy blood, which is alkaline blood, which is at 7.4. So it's a really narrow range, but we all want our blood to look like this. Uh, and glutamine's important in that. Uh, why a lot of people take it who may or may not be athletes is for their small intestine. Um, if they're having leaky gut, food allergies, autoimmune, it can often be due to a glutamine deficiency. And so a lot of people will take this. I actually took glutamine for like two years and it did help. Um, attitude helped more. All right, it helps your immune system. Everything seems to help our immune system. Um, I don't take it anymore because I absolutely believe that we're supposed to eat whole food. And um, I also don't have the time to work out like I used to because of this interesting situation. So it does help our brain function. It helps us as human growth hormone, uh, which is another interesting topic, which helps with fat metabolism and muscle building and helps to stabilize your blood glucose. Um, so it's, it's a really cool topic. If you wanna, you can find lots of research. Homocysteine is another one. It itself is not the amino acid. This is trying to show the metabolism of it. Methionine is the amino acid. Uh, and in the pathway of methionine, homocysteine is made. And you can see B vitamins are really crucial in this. Oh, and what is this? This is a heart. Homocysteine is related to heart disease. It's actually might be a stronger indicator than cholesterol or as strong. Uh, basically, it damages vessels. How? Well, it increases oxygen free radicals, and so free radicals damage the vessels, and it leads to blood clots because it increases thromboxin A, which clots blood. It increases lipoprotein A, which coats the arteries, so then the blood clots get stuck. It increases your LDLs and triglycerides, which coat the arteries and form the clots. And it leads to more calcium deposits, which harden the arteries. Doesn't sound like this is very good for your heart, does it? So what causes you to have high levels of homocysteine? We all have levels of homocysteine. What causes high levels is when you're low in the B vitamins. Where do you get your B vitamins from? Oh, it turns out from your microbiota. And your microbiota needs fruits and vegetables and beans. And those foods also are very high in those sources, but most of our B vitamins actually come from our microbiota. All right. Oh, the other cause of high levels of homocysteine is foods that are high in methionine because it's right there. So this pathway, and it gets stuck here because then the B vitamins can't convert it. 
and methionine is very high in animal protein. So meat, dairy, eggs. Uh, also people with kidney disease, high insulin, uh, cigarettes, nitrous oxide, oh, if you just happen to be a male, uh, or postmenopausal. Uh, coffee's an interesting one. I think somebody picked the topic, coffee. Uh, ETOH is alcohol, and genes if you believe in that. We get to that topic soon. All right, and a decrease actually decreases your risk of heart disease by huge amounts, but there is a genetic, it's a, you would know, because everybody in your family would have heart attacks in their 40s, um, but is absolutely controllable by diet. All right, so really fascinating topic. This was another topic somebody picked, and I'd never heard of it, but it is an amino acid that is found in matcha. That's where it's found. It's It actually works as a neurotransmitter uh, that helps promote relaxation. It's probably because it looks a lot like glutamate. Again, picture is shown incorrectly, huh? They forgot to ionize it. This would be our alpha amino acid right here. And it helps you to relax and it mellows the caffeine effect. Um, anyway, another cool topic. All right, this was a cool slide I found today. And look, I have a reference down there. Uh, this is correctly shown, because it's from Biochem Book. I'm pretty sure that I posted for you all. And it, we're gonna bring them together and we make our peptide bond. So notice you lose this oxygen and you lose two of these hydrogens. So you lose a water molecule, oxygen and two hydrogens. There is still one hydrogen on the nitrogen and we make a peptide bond. This amino acid over here, I don't remember saying this in my video, this amino acid is called the N-terminus or the amino terminus because it's still hanging out there. So when I made my one that was four long, Oh gosh, I don't remember what my first one was. I think it was alanine. Alanine would have been my amino terminus. And then here, my C terminus or carboxyl terminus is the one that ends up all the way at the other um, end that still has a uh, C. And I think that was the aspartate in the slide, the thing I showed. This is actually what I worked on. ODC is ornithine decarboxylate. So that's how I got to be a funny dud. Uh, and it is made up of 461 amino acids. And so amino acids have a full name, a three letter code um, that you'll see me using. And then they have a one letter code that I don't remember at all anymore, but uh, it was a way to write these. This is not the biggest one, but M here, which um, would be the N terminus and B, which I know is valine is the C terminus. All right, um, so what we're gonna go over now are protein functions. So what I just talked about is what your homework set five is, is drawing out amino acids and putting them together into um, tripeptides or dipeptides or something and classifying them. But I want to go over some of the functions of proteins because yeah, they're the building blocks of our body. And so let's look at them. All right. So function number one, you should be taking notes. These, um, you want this nice and clean in your notes, is enzymes. So next week we have a whole lecture and a homework set on enzymes. And enzymes do not just cut, they fix things. So these are specifically restriction enzymes which cut. But enzymes are biological catalysts. Does anybody remember what a catalyst is? Oh, Jamie? Is that you who said? It speeds up reactions. So yeah, a catalyst makes a reaction go much faster. Um, and so our body, to allow it to go in real time, we need catalysts. All right, these, our digestion is one place where we find enzymes. So proteases, lipases, amylases. Um, and so you do need to know examples of each type of function. There are seven, I believe. So a protease or lipase would be something that cuts lipids. Amylase cuts amylose. Remember that? Just had a test on it. Or you're taking the test right now as I'm videotaping. <coughs> All right. Each protein that we will go through has a unique shape. And that gives it its unique function. Um, and the shape, maybe that was one of you sending me an email, you have a question on the test. All right, shape determines the function. And you'll hear me keep saying that today and actually more in the next slideshow. The second function is structure. 
This is all one function. So you can either think of it as structure, shape, or support. And keratin is one. There's two big examples here. One is keratin. This is in your hair. Um, and so if you have curly hair like mine, you will see these curl, beautiful curly cues that happen in your hair. You can shape your hair into all different wonderful shapes and structure. It's also your nails. And if you have horns or hooves, they're also made out of keratin. Um, and the other big example is collagen. Collagen is your blood vessels your tendons, your skin, and it's also part of your bone. Now your bone obviously has hard minerals, calcium, um, hydroxyapatite, right? But it does also have collagen in there. And this wonderful reggae um, Jamaican, also Tibetans have these colors in their flag, is the triple helix, uh, which is collagen. It's a really famous structure. Um, and it's a, it's a braid, so all the girls in here have made braids, uh, which gives it. Now, something that's interesting in this picture as opposed to our enzyme picture, you can see these are long fibrous um, because their importance is in structure. One third of all your protein in your body is collagen. I'm not going to ask you that, but that's pretty like, wow, but look at all these places you find it. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a triple helix, and it's stronger than steel think about the potential there if we could like make this oh and scurvy so this is really weird right before we all got kicked out of being on campus that day in fact I was walking in and I passed a student who lives down former student lives down the street and I said how are you doing that I thought she was gonna say you know because the coronavirus stuff was just showing up and she said well I found out I have scurvy and I just kind of looked at her, trying to keep my distance, because we we're all being told to keep a distance, but thinking, scurvy. Like, we know what to do for scurvy. So scurvy is absolutely related to a lack of vitamin C, and so that's why Johnny Depp and Pirates of the Caribbean, when they were out on the ocean for a long time, they didn't get their fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, and so what happens is these vessels, vitamin C keeps them nice and tight so if you make a braid you want it to be nice and tight and the braid starts coming apart and get these gaps in your blood vessels and blood's going to come out and you get skin lesions you get bleeding gums your teeth fall out you have fragile blood vessels and you basically bleed to death inside um, and so this was a theory from linus pauling i may have mentioned it um, so Linus Pauling, it turns out our body produces something when we have a lack of vitamin C and it coats our blood vessels and eventually it blocks our blood vessels completely off and we have a heart attack and die, but we don't bleed to death. So he said it was a precaution. So if we didn't have fruits and vegetables in our 20s, we could still reproduce and then we would be dead 10 years later when we're completely occluded. So just eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Hopefully you're doing a healthy change. There's still time to join in. It's 30 days uh, and it would have to be due by June 8th. So you still have a week to pick a healthy change. Three fruits a day. All right, so um, anyway, you're more susceptible to free radical damage. Um, yeah, all right, uh, and the skin, another big thing for healthy skin, this is a total myth, is they tell you to drink collagen water. So your stomach is where digestion of, and of proteins happens. Collagen is a protein. You drink that, you're going to get it broken down in your stomach um, by the enzymes in there and you're not getting any collagen. So just keep it healthy by eating lots of fruit lots of water in there too. It keeps you hydrated. All right, function number three, transport. Big one here is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a big transporter. There's of course many other transporters in our body. This is all hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is huge. It has four different polypeptide chains. It's hundreds of amino acids. Um, and that's what it's showing to you. Something really fascinating. So we have two alpha units and two beta units. Um, when you have, uh, when you're pregnant, 
the fetus actually has, I believe it's two alpha and two gamma units, and the gamma units have a greater attraction for oxygen. So the baby actually is able to suck oxygen from you. So any of you who've ever been pregnant, you remember going through that when it feels like, my gosh, this baby sucking all the air out of me because they really are. That was Joey going, oh dear, did I do that? Yeah, you did, Joey. But it's worth it because, and when they take that first breath, something happens and it reverts the beta form. Um, most proteins, by the way, do have an extra group. This group here is the heme group, which is where hemoglobin gets its name. And that's what binds the oxygen. In the middle of that is the iron. Um, all right, this is just a picture of, that's a normal red blood cell. So they're beautiful. The hemoglobin would be part of it. This is a hemoglobin with one mistake, one misplaced amino acid. And you can see it's not making as beautiful a structure. It is an acidic unit, glutamate, being changed into valine, nonpolar. Um, and what happens is that nonpolar one doesn't want to be on the outside anymore. And so it's trying to pull everything in. And you end up with red blood cells that look like the you know, death's sickle. Uh, and so they become deformed, elongated, sickle-shaped blood cells um, that still transports oxygen, but doesn't really pass through the capillaries, the tiniest little blood vessels at the tips of our fingers, for those of us who still have fingertips. And uh, we get, you can get organ damage, not we, um, but uh, it's found in African Americans. Um, and I talk about more when we get to DNA, because this is a true genetic disease. Uh, there is actually treatment for it now, but it is it's just an example. All right, another protein function is storage. So several examples here, myoglobin, whenever you see this prefix myo, it means muscle. This is a heme unit again. So it's just, it's actually huge. This thing's one of the biggest, I think it might be the biggest protein in our body. It is found in your muscles and it specifically stores oxygen in your muscles. Your muscles are the greediest thing in your body, really, greedier than your brain. And they get oxygen and they just store it. Remember all that glucose they were storing is glycogen and they never share it again? They do the same with oxygen. They're like, I gotta have it ready, gotta be ready to go. I'm really important, I gotta be able to run. All right, this is ferritin, and as the name implies, ferrous is iron, and so it stores iron. Uh, and this is prolamin, and it's a storage. So um, seeds and egg whites, because eggs are really for nourishing uh, the baby chick, right, uh, are loaded with a bunch of storage proteins for uh, different minerals like iron and so gluten. Um, is a protein and it is one of the prolamins. Um, and I don't know much more about them. I tried to look it up and it's hard because then you just get all the gluten stuff. I do talk about gluten, I think eventually, unless I already did. All right, protein function five is communication. This is a big one. We're gonna come back to this one in much more detail next week. Uh, but your hormones, not all your hormones, but some, Big example here is insulin. This is a picture of insulin. It's not very big. It's only 51 amino acids. This is another picture of insulin. This, oh, neurotransmitters. Some of them are also proteins. They're usually pretty small, like four to 12 or something like that amino acids. This big baby here, this is your insulin receptor. All receptors for hormones, neurotransmitters, whatever you're receiving. Remember them embedded in our cell membrane? That's what this humongous protein is. This is insulin. Look how tiny it is. And so this would be outside the cell. This would be inside. And all this area here, this is the hydrophobic area because it's crossing the cell membrane. So it's pretty cool. And you can see all these areas of pattern. Um, and so these patterns we'll be talking about in the next slideshow. All right, so insulin is one example. Another example of a hormone that is a protein. So not all hormones are proteins and not all proteins are hormones. We saw some are enzymes, some are structure. Uh, this is oxytocin. And I don't think anybody's picked this as a topic. 
Uh, oxytocin is known as our love hormone. So in labor and delivery and breastfeeding, you release oxytocin. And so it's, it's um, for bonding. And so our little puppy and kitty, so sweet. All right, protein function number six is defense. So our immunoglobulins, um, big word there. Yeah, this is another area of structure. We can see areas of regular structure and then our overall 3D, which is really important. Um, also blood clotting. So I didn't know where to put that, but some of the things in blood clotting are also proteins. Oh, and then number seven, I finally get to it, which is your muscles. I did not put it as number one, but it is specifically actin and myosin. Those who've had anatomy, you know these examples. Um, so again, myo means muscle. So myosin is a mus is a um, example of a protein for movement, and they are definitely fibrous because they're long fibers. And yeah, so I figured, you know, we always show men as if they're muscular. Uh, women have muscles too. And then I decided, you know what? She's not even doing crow correctly. She's doing like the scarecrow or something. Her elbows are not bent fully. Mine aren't either. So I decided I'd show a picture of me doing it like not on a nice flat surface, but let's do it like, oh my gosh, those are oyster shells. Yeah, it was a little pain. There was no blood though. All right. So fiber or globular functions. Well, what functions were the fibrous ones? The ones that dealt with movement and structure. And so the connective tissues, our muscles and our vessels, uh, the proteins that are in our cells that are doing the work, the enzymes, the immunoglobulins, those guys were the big globs and um, our hormones, neurotransmitters are smaller globs, um, but they are, um, sorry, the shape determine the function. All right. So there is an eighth function. And that is proteins can be used as a backup energy source. And when does that happen? Oh, it turns out that happens when you don't eat carbohydrates. Your body starts breaking down your muscles. But two Nobel Prize, one, this, this was a big Nobel Prize in 2016. So autophagy or autophagy is the two different ways I've seen it, uh, which means self-eating. So it's how cells recycle proteins. We have a recycling system inside every cell. 1974 Nobel Prize was for lysosomes. So if you took biology, you learned about lysosomes. Lysosomes are the recyclers in our cells. They break down the old proteins and release the amino acids to be used again. So we don't, um, yeah. And so it's a recycling system. It's how our body cleans plaque in our brain and arteries. So how, this was huge. This is like what a lot of stuff is about. That's a hard to interpret online, um, but this is the guy who won it. So he said life is an equilibrium state between synthesis and degradation of proteins. I would say life is an equilibrium state, but these are some of the things he talked about that are absolutely related to autophagy. Um, which is stress, neurodegenerative diseases, cancer. So how this is actually a good thing. This is a natural thing that should be going on in our, in our body. And if this is happening, it helps to keep your insulin low. And if your insulin is low, this also happens uh, and also boosts your growth hormone. So how can we make sure to keep this happening? Oh, avoiding animal protein and intermittent fasting. So that's eating only for eight hours of the day, which so if you eat breakfast at 8 a.m., you don't eat again after 4 p.m. or if you eat at 9 a.m., let's say is more likely. Um, and also fasting. Um, however, there's big buts there uh, about fasting correctly. Most people don't do it right. Uh, Juice on a fast is very different. Um, you have to do your own made juice and stuff. And I've done juice fasts and they are amazing. You do go into, um, as your body switches around, 
it's not pretty, the emotional state. And all you think about is food and going to bed. You just want to go to sleep because then you're not thinking about food. All right. So let's talk about high protein diet because this is out there. Everyone's like, oh, I got to get protein. I got to get protein. Oh my gosh, there's going to be a meat shortage because the awful, awful slaughterhouses are shut down. And so what happens if you're on a high protein diet? Oh, most of you are anyway, before even the high protein fads. Most people get twice what is recommended, more than double. In fact, mother's milk is less than half of this um, per like the size of the baby. And that's when the baby is growing the most. So the biggest, there's I think six or seven things here. This is just awful. Protein acidifies your blood. Um, and I showed this picture before. Number one cause is meat, also sugar and stress and all that stuff. We want our blood to be alkaline, meaning at the higher end of normal. So 7.2 to 7.4 acidic blood. You eat animal products, you're gonna have 7.2. You're gonna be alive, but your blood's not really healthy. When you have acidic blood, what is going on is your body has to balance that. So you actually pull calcium out of your bones. Number one cause of osteoporosis is, is eating too much protein. You can go and look, the dairy industry has paid a lot of money to have you believe otherwise. Um, so eating a lot of protein causes higher rates of osteoporosis, higher rates of fractures, higher rates of arthritis, because the calcium then deposits in our joints. And when they look at people who are genetically similar, so African-American women and women who are still in Africa, and the rates of osteoporosis or hip fractures or in all these different parts of the world, looking at people who move to a, a place like the U.S. where we eat high-protein diets. Um, yeah, and this is animal protein is... Um, the other thing is cancer cells only grow at a pH of 7.2. They cannot grow in alkaline blood. All right. I have another slide on that in a moment. Uh, exposure to toxins. Animal protein. You are getting exposed to the antibodies, the growth hormone, and the pesticides. This was the kindest picture I could find. You can Google it if you had no idea. And you can see what the factory farms really are like. Degenerative Diseases, absolutely. One of the best books ever written. This is T. Colin Campbell, did the biggest study, um, and it was comparing Americans, uh, and so he was at Cornell and comparing Americans and Chinese, and they went and did all these tests on them. Uh, and the movie, actually, you're supposed to watch, so most of you probably have watched it before doing this, uh, Forks Over Knives. Uh, they interview him quite a bit in it. It's based off of his research. He's in his 90s now and still lectures, is very active, not lecture in college because he travels all over the world giving lectures, plays racquetball with his grandkids and stuff. Um, it's amazing. Anyway, 17 times higher rate of heart disease, five-fold higher rates of breast cancer, et cetera. Okay, number four, it kidneys. You have to get rid of the nitrogen because you're taking in more nitrogen than your body needs, even if you're a bodybuilder. And the only way you can get rid of that nitrogen is from your kidneys. Your kidneys just get depleted. Fastest way to kidney disease is eat that high protein diet, that myth that we're gonna have. Oh, and you don't poop because you're not having any fiber. So beans have protein and fiber. This stuff up here under T. Colton Campbell that I'm hiding, there's no fiber in there. Oh, and number six, well, look at that. It can send you ketosis. Isn't that kind of a fad going on? Except they don't say the full name of it. It's actually correctly called ketoacidosis. Should we go back and talk about the acidic blood and the pH, which also weakens your brain and your kidneys? All right. All right, so there you go. Another picture, healthy blood, uh, acidic blood. So you're still alive, you're functioning, 
that you're not functioning well because your brain, your kidneys, and all bits of you are just miserable. Oh, and your microbiota. Your microbiota says, what are you feeding me? People will eat animal products. The amount of animal products that Americans eat, your microbiota is deplorable. So thinking you can take a poo pill and that's going to change it, it doesn't. You have to change your lifestyle. It takes a little bit of time and you have to eat legumes. You have to eat fruit. You have to eat a green salad every day. Yes, every day. So it's not dramatic apparently to cut your ribs open and do open heart surgery, but it is dramatic to eat three pieces of fruit a day. Hmm. And oh, we're back to this, age. Hopefully you all got this right on the test. Hopefully maybe you giggled and jiggled a little bit. Um, so I don't remember I mentioned that bacon is a class one carcinogen. It's actually up there higher than cigarettes now. Guaranteed. You know how hard it is to become a class one? Oh, smoking. Alcoholic beverages, processed meat. That's all that lunch meat. You can't eat it. Stop eating it. It's guaranteed. Uh, and so I, I have a slide. It's in the next slideshow. We talked a little bit about it. This was actually a talk I heard. This guy's actually a really good speaker. Um, and so I I, I would YouTube him. I've never had a chance to read the book. I usually read books during this term, but I am way overextended. Uh, and so he was, like T. Collins Campbell talks about the movie, he was big into proteins. He's a doctor. And then he went and got his blood work done when he turned 50 and he was horrified. And so he, he turned the living room and dining room into like just reading and he is now plant-based. Um, and so it was just looking at heart disease and animal products, breast cancer and animal products, uh, hip fractures and animal products, uh, lymphoma, which type, oh my God, this terrible story. This guy, never mind, I won't tell it to you, we'll get upset. All right, intestinal cancers and animal-based. So I'm not saying you can never eat meat. I'm saying you gotta eat a lot less. You gotta eat a lot more uh, vegetables and fruit and legumes. And if you want to make that your healthy change and say, you know what? No, I love animals. I'm going to give up meat for a month. That's going to be my healthy challenge. I'm going to see if I can do it just for Dr. Sherpa and those extra bonus points is really why you're doing it. This slide is Mama Gaia and you can Google. I'll put it in my thing. Uh, besides giving up meat, do it for your love of this planet. The number one cause of global warming is our obsession with the hamburger. Just look at this one down here. One hamburger, how much water it causes, deforestation. All of this is related um, to this beautiful cow. How can you eat it? Anyway, for the love of the planet, cut down. All right, we're gonna do some practice. Before we practice, these are gonna be our amino acids. Um, so I apparently am gonna make a quick comment about MSG. Joey actually picked this as his topic, but I have a picture here. I think I, yeah, cause this is um, glutamate or glutamic acid. And so glutamic acid is incorrectly shown here. It is correctly shown here as glutamate where it is ionized. So this part here is, this here is our carbon. They turned it sideways. This is the side group. So this is an acidic amino acid and monosodium glutamate, MSG, is when one sodium is added to there. And yeah, go figure, right? Joey wants to know this guy's meme, but um, that's the problem is now we can all stop and analyze everything that's on my screen. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, MS glutamate is a neurotransmitter and so a lot of people get headaches from the amount of MSG that's added to food. So we're gonna do practice. Hopefully I don't get cut off by my computer. I think it is, here we go. All right. Back in Tinkerbell. Back. So we're gonna draw these. See what I mean? So, 
carbon, four lines, hydrogen above, carboxyl group, but you lose that hydrogen, always ionize it, and the amino group, also ionized, always a zwitter ion. And you guys have your notes. You always will have that chart. What else can I do? So benzyl, those are your chem 105. Anybody remember? Dominique? Someone, oh yeah, I got that one. So benzene. It's a hexagon with a ring in it. There we go. Phenylalanine. Now, what you should all be able to do is to look at that and say, okay, just based on this part, there is just lines. This means it's only carbons and hydrogen. That means nonpolar or hydrophobic. When we get to part two, the next video, these guys are going to be in the center, always hanging out in the center. All right. Now we can change it to a blue marker. I know, I forgot to have a fairy. Got another wand. Glutamine. So again, carbon, four lines, hydrogen, carboxyl group. I think you guys actually have a disadvantage because you become so dependent on your notes that you don't actually ever learn these. So, yeah, my other class, they have time limits now. So we'll see what happens with you guys. All right, so ionize and prop means three carbons. Now you can draw the carbons out or you can do a zigzag one, two, three. And then amine means, okay, we're gonna have a nitrogen. Oh, but that's not an amine, it's an amide. So for those who have chem 105, so you may remember that would mean here, you actually have a double bond O. This makes this one polar. It is not acidic or basic. Uh, so the combination of both the oxygen and nitrogen, this one is polar neutral is what they call it because it's neither acidic nor basic. I avoid ones like this on quiz and test. I put it here because of the similarity to glutamate. Um, all right, let's draw lysine. And so you already drew it, right? Your four carbons, you guys can be ahead of me. And always ionized in our body, always ionized. All right. And butyl would mean four carbons. So two, 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 two. So one, two, three, four. And then the fourth one's gonna have the amine group. Now this is truly an amine group, so it will be ionized. And I found a new chart that you guys have uh, for your notes. And this new chart actually shows them correctly ionized. All right, and then our last one, we'll do it in green, is uh, glutamate, which would be the correct name for it. So four things around our carbon. Remember, this is our alpha carbon because it has everything around it. And I just realized we're getting glare. Let's see if that works better. Maybe, maybe not. All right. I don't know what you really need to see. You got the idea. Uh, and down here, uh, if you want, you can draw the carbons in. I'll draw them in for this one. It would have three total carbons, and this last one would have the double bonded O and the O negative. If you draw the carbons in, though, you'll have to show your hydrogens there. So. Uh, you can draw it like that. You can show the double bond with O down. The thing that's important is this one is an acidic side group. Because it has that negative, it can do the salt bridges. And also, it's probably because I'm using the grades for Tinkerbell. All right, it also can do H bonds. The one right before it was basic. And I should probably just stick to black and blue uh, because it has this nitrogen group. And so also the salt bridge and the H bonds. 
is I, that is something that becomes important in our next video because this is the piece that determines our extra functions. And this one that was polar, all it can do is the H bonds because it doesn't have a plus or minus in that side group. So just the H bonds. Got? All right. Uh, let's see. We're going to now make it into a tetrapeptide. So four amino acids. And so you are going to do the fairy godmother is going to erase them. We'll just use glue. And we go, boop. We make a bond. But you are going to do the fairy godmother is going to erase them. We'll just use glue. And we go, boop. We make a bond. But if you watch the first video, which you must have if you got this far, you have to add that hydrogen back to the nitrogen. Actually, never left. Nitrogens make three bonds. The carbon makes four bonds, so it's complete. Um, so there's just the double bonded O, and then this carbon goes straight to that. That is our peptide bond. And then here, go ahead and erase your. Oh, and H's, because we're losing water. And oh, some Tinkerbell magic. And there you go. Oh, don't forget to add this, and you lose the plus. And one more. So, um, you can circle it. I'm just circling it to make sure you see it. If I ask you to circle it, you will. This one, by the way, I don't remember if I talked about it. This is called the amino terminus because it has that amino end. And so we would say phenylalanine. Sometimes they just say the end terminus. And this one down here is called the carboxy terminus. Or just C for short. And that's it. You got it. That's drawing our amino acids. And I will see you soon. Good day.